Hey, what's up? How you doing? Welcome to another video. Hope you are well. So today's going to be a settings video, specifically around the X-T4. However, a lot of these settings do carry over from the X-T3 and even from an X-H1, for example. Um, a lot of the buttons are laid out very similar and can be assigned in similar ways. Obviously, the X-T4 does have the most customization available. So everything I talk about, you can do on the X-T4, but maybe about 80% or 70% you can do on the X-T3 and the X-H1. Also, this button layout, I've been using it for the last year and a half, and there's only been one or two small changes for the X-T4 in particular. So this method is definitely tried and tested, and having sort of going backwards and forwards between different layouts and setups, in my experience, I found this to be the most useful. As always, if you have a look in the description below, you will find all the timestamps for the various parts of the video, as well as links to anything that I talk about during this video. Oh, and finally, before I begin, just to avoid confusion, this video is not me going through every single menu item on this camera. It's me going through the most useful menu items and the most useful settings and setup of this camera for general use. Let's begin with accessories. Now there's a couple accessories that I use on all my cameras all the time and both of these were in the previous video if you asked um, where I got them from. So the first one is this little gold uh, shutter button extender. Effectively just screws into the shutter button and it gives your finger a better platform to rest. The second thing is this Arca Swiss plate. Specifically, this is a Peak Design plate from the capture clip which goes onto your backpack. The reason I use this on all my cameras is because, well, two reasons. The first one, everything I own is Arca Swiss. So I can take this camera, put it on one tripod, put it on the Gorilla Pod, put it on the mini tripod, put it in a gimbal, put it into this tripod, and even clip it into my capture clip if I'm walking. And also, because you've got those little um, cutouts, that means you can put the actual clips for the um, neck strap. So if you have a big lens or a heavy lens, you can then attach it straight to that, rather than using the bits on the side which creates a more comfortable and more secure fit as well. And the final accessory is an app called Fujifilm X Acquire. It's an official Fujifilm bit of software from the website. And all it does is it takes a snapshot of your camera, of all the settings, of all the profiles, of everything, and saves it as a file. So God forbid you lose your camera and get stolen or you damage it you know, beyond repair or you have to wipe it or whatever it is, you can then connect the new camera or the formatted camera into your computer and then it will reload all the settings, all the profiles, everything back on the camera which will save you like at least an hour of setting up. Right, let's get into the buttons and the dials setup of this video. I will walk you through how I've set up each button and dial, why I've done it like that and what impact it has on the general use of the camera. We'll start with this front button here, and I've got it set up to a large histogram. The reason for that is because sometimes if it's a really bright day and I'm doing video, I want to see a bigger histogram on the screen, even though I've got a smaller one already on there. Also, this is a button that's very easy to press by accident if you're just normally holding the camera. So if I do press it by accident, I don't want it to be anything significant that will change how the camera operates. Next up is the function button right next to the shutter. I've always had this set to shutter type, so whether it's electronic or mechanical shutter. The reason it's there, it's easy to remember because it's right next to the shutter and it's easy to get to if I need to make a quick change. Moving to the back of the camera, the Q button is set to Q as the default, which is a quick menu. We'll go through that later. The AF on button is set to AF on because it's a very nice place for where your thumb is going to lie. The AEL button, I have changed that to focus type. So whether it's single point, zone or all. And the reason it's there is because it's right next to the joystick. So it's very easy for me to go from changing the focus location on the screen with the joystick to changing the focus type if I need to make a quick change. Now let's have a look at the joystick and as you've expected, it's a joystick. It allows you to move the focus point around the screen. However, if you press the joystick, you will get into the little sub menu with all the squares and you've got a couple of options. So if you double tap or double press, sorry, the joystick, you can reset your focus point. So if you've you know focused over there and you want it quickly back in the center, just double press it and that resets it. Also, if you press it once and you get into the squares, 
Some options such as zone focusing and single point focusing will allow you to change the size of the zone or the focus point simply by turning the rear dial. Moving down towards the D-pad, so the top button I've got it saved to face detect. Again, this is the closest button to the focus joystick. So these three here will do all of my focusing, phase detection, everything. And it's a very easy and quick place to get to it. Moving right, this does the white balance. So this is specifically a video setting and not a photo setting because on photo I use auto white balance and raw anyway. Now, this brings me on to a good point. And even though this camera, as you know, separates the photo and the video modes, the button assignments are not separated. For some reason, I'm not sure why. So whatever you've got this set to in photo mode will also be in video mode. Now, white balance in video is very important. So I wanna make sure I can get to it as quickly as possible just by pressing this here. Next up is the down button, and this is my IBIS on slash off switch. One important thing to keep in mind is if you have a lens with a dedicated OIS or stabilization switch, that will override this. So whatever your lens is set to, that's the setting. And then this is secondary. However, if your lens is not stabilized, this is your main way of turning IBIS on and off. Now you might be asking, why do you need to switch IBIS on and off? You know, it's a good feature, you should have it on all the time. Not necessarily, because if you're doing street photography on a bright sunny day and you've got a shutter speed of 500, you do not need IBIS because shutter speed will freeze everything already. So by switching it off, you're saving battery. However, later on at night, if it's low light and you're using a lower shutter speed, then you can easily switch it on and then comfortably handhold at slower shutter speeds. And finally, we're moving on to the left button and this is set to AFC settings, specifically custom presets for the autofocus system. Unfortunately, this only applies to photo. This is not applied to video. For video is a different way of doing it, which I'll show you later. And you can basically just toggle whether you want normal autofocus performance, whether you want the autofocus system to you know, only look at things which are moving in the background or things which are moving erratically, and basically fine tune it depending on what it is that you're taking pictures of. Oh, and one, one, one more little thing, a couple little shortcuts. So if you press and hold the Q button, that will allow you to quickly adjust the quick menu settings with regards to what's inside the quick menus. But as I've said, we'll get into quick menus separately. If you press and hold display back, you'll get into the function settings. And here, as you just scroll through, you will see it shows you which button does what, and then you can simply select what you want and go from there. Now, one thing you've noticed is the touch function for the screen are switched off. So on this particular camera, well, I think most of other Fuji cameras with a touch screen, if you swipe the screen left or up or down, it can act as a button. Now I have that switched off because I've done it by accident many times and it's a bit annoying. So I don't need any more buttons. And for me, it's just not worth having. That's why I have it switched off. Now let's talk about shutter and focusing. So a lot of people obviously focus using the shutter and a lot of people focus using back button. I do a combination of both. So in AFS and AFC modes, I use the shutter button to focus as well. In the XT line, there is a clear difference between a half press and a full press. A lot of people don't like it, but I quite like it because you know exactly that you are focusing and you know exactly when you're taking a picture. In a leaf shutter system, like on an X-H1, it's not as clear cut, which is where back button focusing makes more sense. However, I've got back button focusing set up also, so I can just choose which one I wanna use. So if I go and take a picture, I can back button focus, and then that overrides the shutter, so I can just press the shutter to take the picture. Alternatively, I can just half press the shutter if I want. Finally, if I go into manual focusing, I have got this set up so that I can still back button focus in manual mode and then the shutter button has no impact on the autofocus. To set this up, go into your settings then into button dial settings and then down towards shutter AF and shutter AE. And this is where you select if you want the shutter button to do um, autofocus and auto exposure for AFS or AFC as well. With regards to back button focusing in manual mode, go into the AF-MF settings, the middle page, and then scroll down to instant AF setting, and then you can set it to AFC or AFS, depending on what you want. 
With the buttons out of the way, let's get into the dials. So let's start with the front one. The front one is a button and you can press it in. I've got this set to shutter speed and exposure. So press it once and you have shutter speed, press it again and you can adjust the exposure. Moving on to the back button, if you just turn it, that adjusts your ISO. And if you turn it all the way to the end, you get into the auto ISO settings. I'll go through them in a minute. If you push it in or press it, sorry, um, you get the punch and zoom. So if you're doing, let's say, manual focusing, you can do a quick digital zoom and see what's in focus. If you press and hold it, it will switch on further focusing assistance, such as speaking. Moving to the top dials, the ISO, I always have it set in C, which is command, and that allows you to adjust it on the back here. The shutter speed, I have it set to T, and T is again, same as command, and it lets you adjust the shutter speed there. As for the exposure compensation, I have it set to C, which is command, and again, that lets you adjust it on the dial on the front. You might be wondering, well, why I get a camera with all of these nice top dials if you're just going to have it on your thumb and your index finger. And the reason for that is because if you're doing street photography or you're somewhere warm and nice, it's easy to use these. If you're hiking or if it's freezing outside, you've got massive gloves. Yeah, good luck using these. That's where these come in very handy. And last but not least is the aperture dial on every lens. And to be honest, I have everything there set to default. You can change what A stands for, but to me, A is just still auto. Now to set up the actual dials, it's a bit of a longer process. So you go into menu, you then go into the sort of wrench or whatever your spanner menu, whatever it's called. Um, you then go down to button dial settings. Then you go down to command dial settings. So as you see here, these two show the front one and then the back one is the back one. So simply press it and then you can select what you want. And on the front, as you see, I've got my shutter speed and then the second click, I've got the overall exposure. Now let's talk about how I actually take photos with this camera and why I've got these things set up in such a way. So there are two main ways I use it. The first one is in manual and the second one is aperture priority with a few caveats. So 90% of, 99% of my photography is manual because I just like to have control over what I'm taking a picture of and over how it's exposed. However, in some cases, it's simply not feasible to have in manual because you'll miss shots. So if you're always going from super dark to super bright areas and there's a lot going on and you quickly need to take a picture, Having it in manual is just going to stop you from getting the shot because you might not be able to adjust quick enough. That's when I take the camera into aperture priority and I set these up in a certain way. Let's start with full manual control and I'll quickly run through the settings. So first of all, the aperture dial, just set it to a number, let's just say F2. The ISO dial, set it to C to command. And then the shutter speed dial, set it to T, which is command as well. The exposure compensation dial is irrelevant here, but that's how I've got my manual set up. So I can quickly go from adjusting the aperture, adjusting the ISO and adjusting the shutter speed. Very easy, very quick. Now let's talk about aperture priority. And as I've mentioned, it's for scenarios where I physically can't change the settings quick enough in order to get the shot. Now for this, I will set the exposure compensation dial to C. I will then make sure the lens is set to let's say F2, for example, and then I will set the shutter speed to auto. And as for the ISO, I will leave it on C. I will then use the ISO dial on the back and scroll all the way to the end past 500,000. That's when you get into the three custom auto ISO settings. And these are really important because these really dictate how your camera behaves. So the first one, I have it set to ISO 3200. That's a comfortable amount that I'm happy with with regards to noise performance. Shutter speed, minimum shutter speed, I've got it set to 100. This means that the camera will never, under any circumstance, go below 100 shutter speed. This setting I will use for low light photography and generally anywhere where there's not much light. The second auto ISO setting still maintains 3200, which is a good performance. However, the shutter speed has increased to 500. Now, the reason for that is because this is my go-to street photography, daytime, bright, sunny day setting. And I know that I can trust this camera to make sure that everything within reason is not blurry and I can get good pictures on bright, sunny days. 
Auto ISO 3, that's my super low light setting. Now the ISO has gone up to 6400. In my experience on these sensors, 6400 is what I am happy with with regards to noise performance. Anything above that, there's a bit too much noise for me. The shutter speed is set to 100 minimum. So again, I know that anything under 100, the camera will just not select, it will keep it at 100. You might be asking, why did you pick 100? And basically, again, this is just from my experience, but 100 is when I'm comfortable enough to know that I will not have that much camera shake. Now, keep in mind that these settings are from the X-T3. Now that I've got IBIS, I could get away with a lower shutter speed. However, since we're in lockdown, I can't actually go out and test it yet. Um, but if I will, and I do need to update it, then I will give you guys an update. Now to set up the ISO auto settings, you go into the shooting settings in the menu, down to ISO auto settings, and then you can select auto one, two, and three, so let's select two. And here you can change the default sensitivity, max sensitivity, and the shutter speed, as I've just mentioned. So as you can see, I've got it set to 500, Max 3200, default 160, and if we're going to three, I've got it set to 6400, as I've mentioned, and that's how you set that up. Now that the auto ISO setting is set up, the next thing is the overall exposure. So if you remember, the index finger dial, if you pressed it in once, it gave you shutter speed, and if you pressed it in again, it gave you overall exposure. So if you press it in again, now this controls the overall exposure and then the camera will say either to overexpose or to underexpose a photo and then it will do what it needs to do to make that happen. What that means for me is if I'm walking around, I just need to take a quick picture and not worry about the settings. I just literally use this dial and everything else the camera does. Now the one last thing which is very useful with this method is if I now go back into full manual, I can still technically select the exposure dial but when you turn it, nothing happens. And this is like almost my security, so I don't accidentally change the shutter speed, which I've done a few times. If I press it in again, and I say I know I want 400, it will not change it until I press it in again. So it's a bit like a safety lock as well. With the physical buttons out of the way, let's now talk about the quick menu. So the Q button on the camera. In the previous generations of Fuji cameras, I always thought the quick menu wasn't very good, to be honest, it was a bit too cluttered. However, I'm glad to say that in this, they have completely redesigned it and simplified it, and now it's legitimately useful. Another huge bonus of the quick menu here is that it's completely different for photo and for video, so you can have different settings and a different layout as well. Now, to access the quick menu, you can just press Q once, and the quick menu comes up. However, if you want to adjust it, you can press and hold Q, and then that will get into the settings so you can adjust what each thing does. Now, before I go any further, there are two key settings which you should change first. So if you go into menu, go into settings, you go into button dial settings, and here you see edit save quick menu. So you see for the photo side, it says four, and for the video side, it says eight. That means how many quick menu squares appear in each one. So for me, for photo, there's not that much that I change, so four is enough. However, for video, I've got eight items because there's just more that needs to be adjusted. There's one more setting for quick menu that I would like to show you, and it's under the screen setup. So if you go to options, screen setup, and then go all the way down to get to background. So for photo, I've got it set to black, which is a non-see-through black background. Very easy to see, very high contrast. For video, I've got it set to a see-through background. And the reason for that is because one of my settings in the video quick menu is picture profiles. By having a see-through background, it allows me to see straight away what impact a particular picture profile is having as I scroll through it. I'll show you that in a minute. Now let me quickly tell you what's inside the quick menus and why. So first of all, on the photo side, I've got the self timer, self explanatory, you always want to have a self timer, useful thing to have. Next up is the metering modes. Now I never use them. However, for some auto settings, they are useful. I just have it set to like everything um, that usually does the job well. Now next up is focus speaking. So if I do manual focusing, this is useful to have. And finally is the screen brightness. So if I want to dim the screen, if I'm in a dark environment or brighten it, if I'm in a bright environment, I can do it very quickly using the cube menu. To get into the video cube menu, you now have to change the whole camera into video mode using the dial. 
and then press Q again. For this one, I've got a few more slots because there's a few more things to adjust. So let's start with the first one, which is the custom profiles. And this is where I've got my picture profile and I've got a low contrast or a high contrast picture profile. Next up is the frame rate, then it's the bit rate, and then it's the overall aspect ratio and if it's 4K your HD. Now, even though I don't adjust these things very frequently, it's a very quick way for me to check what I'm filming in because it's nice and big and it's all in one place. However, if I do want to quickly switch from 25 to 50, it literally takes two seconds to do it now, whereas before you'd go into your menus and it's a bit of a faff. On the lower level, I've got the internal or external mic adjustment. So if it's really too loud or too quiet, I can quickly adjust the camera's preamp. Next up, I've got the LCD brightness again, similar reasons as before. Next up is the IBIS boost mode. And although that completely drains the battery, if I need the best performance from the IBIS system, I can have it using this mode, just simply toggle it on and off. And finally is the high speed recording, which is your 120 frames a second and 240 frames a second. Um, if that's what you wanna do, you can quickly switch it on and off there. Now let's talk about my menu. My menu is a custom page of the menu setting where you can save your favorite menu items there that you normally use to save you sort of going through the whole system to try and find them. And I'm glad to report that they are also different on the photo and the video side. So you can have different things saved to each one. In order to set up the my menu settings, you first wanna go into user settings, then down into my menu settings. So let's start with the photo. You click on it, you can go add items, remove items or reorder items, click add, scroll through the stuff that you want to add and then click OK. Now let me just quickly talk you through what I've got in my menu tab and why and we'll start with the video. So first of all at the top we've got F-Log recording so I can quickly switch F-Log on and off. I generally don't use F-Log at all um, or not very much. However, if it's a super high contrast scene, then that's probably the only way to try and retain as much information as possible. So I can quickly switch it on there. Next up is edit slash save custom settings. So this allows me to edit and modify my picture profiles. So if I quickly want to change something in the picture profile, I don't need to troll for all the settings to do that. Next down is film simulation. Even though I'm set in a turner most of the time, if I do need to make a change quickly, that's an easy way of doing it. Next on the list is AFC custom settings. This is a much more simplified version of what you get in photo. And as I've said, for some reason, you can't assign it to a button that also works for photo. It's a bit weird, but basically you can go in there and you can slow down the autofocus, therefore allowing, let's say, slower focus ramps if that's what you want. Next on the list are framing guidelines and yeah, self-explanatory just helps you frame the scene a bit better using various tools. Tally lights, these things are very useful or also a bit of a pain, depends on where you are. So right now I'm at home and I've got a tally light on, on the front of the camera, so I know the camera is recording. If for whatever reason the camera stops recording, the light goes off and I know not to carry on talking rubbish. However, if you're somewhere where you don't want to be noticed, I know this sounds really pervy, but there are legit reasons, um, you can switch off the tally light through this setting. And finally, I've got the mic jack setting and this allows me to change the mic jack from either a microphone input to a line in input from another device, should I want to. Now let's look at the my menu on the photo side. So the first one I've got is interval time shooting, which is basically time lapse. So if you wanna do a time lapse, you go in there, set it all up and off you go. Then I've got interval timer shoot and exposure smoothing and this basically allows the camera to adjust all the exposure parameters. So if you do let's say a night to day time lapse, it can try and smooth it out a little bit. Further down, I've got face eye detection settings. Now this is a deeper menu rather than just on and off and it allows you to set if you're on the right eye or the left eye. I always have this set to any eye and face. I don't really care about which eye it picks up. Next on the list is drive settings and this allows you to do things such as burst mode. So you can either do an exposure burst or you can do a focus stacking burst. Now is the natural live view and this is a really good one. So when this is switched off, let's say even if you're in RAW, you're shooting the RAW photos, if you have your film simulation set to Eterna and then you have an S-curve on the curves feature, 
you will see the Turner profile and the boost and contrast through the viewfinder. Now this is really good because it gives you a closer representation to what the edited file can look like. However, it can also put you off and give you a false sense of contrast that's not there. Natural Live View turns all that off and it's literally a as natural of a picture as possible that the camera sees is what you're going to see. Flash function settings, I don't really use flash. I think I don't even have one, but if I need to use a flash, this is a quick way to get to the setting. And finally, flicker reduction. If I sometimes get flickering in my images for whatever reason, I can switch that on quickly. Now let's talk about bracket settings. And if you don't know, bracket settings are the options on the left hand dial just underneath the ISO setting. So first of all is what types of brackets you can have. You can have focus brackets, you can have white balance brackets, all that stuff. The one I mainly use is simple overall exposure bracketing. So for every picture you take, the camera will take a overexposed picture and an underexposed picture. This is a typical way of doing, let's say, HDR merging later. However, I don't do that a huge amount. However, what I do use it for is to then select a better exposure for the edit that I want to do. So for instance, if I take a picture of a scene and I don't care about the sky being blown out, then I can use the overexposed shot so I can get all the shadow detail. If, however, I want to make sure that everything that in the sky is well exposed and I don't care about certain parts of the foreground going into complete shadow, I can use the underexposed image. Or, of course, I can just blend them in into a HDR photo. However, on the X-T4, it now allows you to do a HDR in RAW. I think on the X-T3, it only let you do it in JPEG, but now you've got RAW HDR as well, where it takes three or four photos and combines them together. And this is seen here as HDR mode. I've got it set to auto. The one other useful feature in bracket settings is focus bracketing. So if you want to do a focus stack later, rather than manually adjusting your focus and then taking a picture, you can set the camera to a start point and an end point, and then it will then adjust the focus bit by bit and take a picture. So you'll end up with, let's say, 30 pictures with the focus at different points. Go into Photoshop and merge them all into one. We'll start with the photo side and first of all image quality so raw I don't use JPEGs on these cameras at least not yet I do want to get more into JPEGs because there's a lot of options here for that but not yet raw recording I always use uncompressed you can have lossless compressed and you can have lossy compressed um, I don't really have issues with the file sizes um, so yeah I just leave it uncompressed film simulation which is for the viewfinder I just have it on the what is it, Astia Soft, because it creates a nice soft look, um, and I like that. Grain off, color chrome off, this is all to do with JPEG settings, so I've not adjusted them yet, and there'll be a whole separate video on JPEG settings specifically. Lens modulation optimizer on, it does some trickery to remove any weird lens distortions in camera. Store AF mode by orientation off, that will confuse the hell out of me, basically it means if you go from portrait to landscape it can change which autofocus setting you use if it's useful then that's cool af point display off that shows you all the focus points but don't need to see it pre af off af illuminator off face eye detection off because i don't need it now af plus mf which is autofocus and manual focus there's no point having both i have them separate depth of field scale this is something new so you can select it as pixel or file format basis. I think it's something to do with how it previews depth field ones for screens, ones for printing. So I use pixel because most photos now go on screens. Uh, release focus priority. So this means does the camera just take a picture or does it wait for focus before it takes a picture? So for AFS, I've got it for focus. The camera will not take a photo until it knows it's in focus. For AFC, I've got it on release because if you're doing bursts of moving subject, you don't want to miss the whole thing because the camera is hunting for focus. Just take the pictures and hope something comes out. All right. Finally, the AF range limiter. That's useful if you are, let's say, using a long lens and you only want to take pictures of things in the background. So let's say you're taking pictures of a football match 
and there are people all the way over there, but you don't want the camera to always try and focus on the man that keeps walking in front of you, you can use this setting to only tell the camera to focus over there and not over here. Now onto movie settings, there's definitely more here. Let's quickly go through them. So movie mode, self-explanatory, whether you want HD, 4K, 25 frames a second, whatever you want. File format, I use the HEVC, which just gives you the best quality. Compression, I use all I, so all I compression will give you a much larger file, but it's not as compressed. And then long dop is a more compressed file, but not as high quality. Fix movie crop magnification, what that means is that when you use certain features of this camera, such as let's say digital stabilization, the camera will crop in a little bit. However, if you switch it off, it'll then crop back out. If you don't want to have that in and out, if you go between these settings, you can just set the camera to always crop at that amount. So whatever feature you use, you will not have a visible crop. IS mode, we've already touched on it. So let's just select IBIS or IBIS digital or off. As I've mentioned probably in my previous XT4 video, I don't really like the digital stabilization. I think IBIS does a good job on its own. Movie optimized control, that's basically as the silent movie control in the previous cameras. Effectively, it then takes all the control away from the physical buttons and moves them onto a touch screen interface. So let's say if you're recording and you want to change the aperture as you're recording, but you don't want obviously the clicks or the camera shake, you can do it via the screen. I don't personally use it, but I can see many use cases where this will be uh, useful. Next up is image quality, and this is where you set your custom profile picture. I only have two, basically a washed out Eterna and a normal Eterna. For those of you who don't know, Eterna is a very low contrast, very filmic um, profile that you had on old Fujifilm cameras. And it's actually a really nice, halfway house between a normal out of a camera picture and F-Log. And everyone who uses Fuji or many people prefer the Turner look to the F-Log because you get 90% of the dynamic range and the quality, but without having to spend like 10 hours grading it and all the faff that comes with F-Log. Now dynamic range, I've got it set to 100. You can go higher if you wish. However, you would need to raise the ISO. Um, but in my experience, I found that 100 does the job for many things. Next up is tone curve, and it's a, just a fancy way of saying highlights and shadows. It's definitely not as much control as I thought I'll have with the tone curve. But anyway, highlights, I've got it to minus 2 and shadows down to minus 2 as well. I think minus 2 here means minus, means plus 2. It's just really weird how they've set it up. But basically, you want to boost the shadows and slightly kill the highlights. In other words, reduce contrast and giving it a more flat look. Color, I've boosted color. So Eterna is a very muted, desaturated look. Um, and even though I like the low contrast, I don't like the low saturation. So I always boost the color in camera because I can always take it away in post if I want to. Sharpness, I've got it set to minus three because I'd rather apply sharpness selectively in post. If you've got parts of the image which are out of focus, they don't need to be sharp. So it's just not worth introducing the extra noise or issues with the um, image. So if you want to save this film profile, you go back into the movie settings and then you scroll down to the edit save custom setting, select which one you want, let's say custom four, custom six, and then click on it and then save current settings, rename it to whatever you want and that's now your custom setting. Of course, you can then have different ones with different film profiles, different exposure levels, um, different highlights, but yeah, you get the idea. Next up are the audio settings, and this is where you'll adjust your mic levels, both internal, external, mic, jack inputs, uh, limiters, wind filters. So I've got all of the wind filters, low cut filters, all of that is switched off. Um, all of that is enabled on the actual mic itself on the road. Um, and then external mic level, I've got it to minus 24 because obviously preamps are better on the mic. Um, but yeah. So now onto the more sort of deeper camera settings. User settings, uh, you only go in here if you want to format your card and also check the battery condition. So if your battery is playing up, you can see if it's messed up or not. Sound setup, I've basically got everything switched off. I don't want this camera to make a single noise. Screen setup, this is where you'll do a lot of adjustments. Now specifically, 
Um, image display off. I don't want the camera to display an image when I've taken it because I've taken it. Um, auto rotate displays. So if you go from landscape to portrait, it will also rotate all the numbers so you can see what you're looking at with regards to shutter speed and stuff like that. Preview exposure white balance. So what that means is it basically works like an EVF should and it gives you a preview of what your exposure and your white balance is. If however you don't want that and you want a more let's say traditional DSLR experience, you can switch that off. Also useful if you're using flash photography, so you're looking at a dark, let's say, subject until the flash goes off, you just switch all that off and then you will have a, let's say, a neutral representation without an influence of white balance or exposure, a bit like a DSLR. F-Log View Assist, so this is a really good one. If you're using F-Log, you can have this switched on and then the camera will apply a very light layer of contrast on top of your F-Log. So you have a realistic, let's say, expectation of what your picture looks like. If you've traditionally shot F-Log without it, it looks completely washed out and weird. But with this, it actually gives you a sense of, a better sense, let's say, of what you're doing. Framing guidelines, we've gone through it. Auto rotate. So basically, if you take a picture in landscape mode or in portrait mode, it will remember that orientation and you will not get a portrait picture sideways. Display custom settings. This allows you to select what you want displayed on the screen and what you don't want. Um, if I just quickly run through this and I'll show you what I've got displayed. So if you're wondering where the histogram came from, the little histogram, that's there. And that's basically how I've got mine set up. So exposure compensation, I've got it as a small digit at the bottom and not the scale on the side because I find it a little distracting. Uh, focus mode flash so basically that's how it's set up with regards to screen and if i'm missing something i can go back here and switch it on but i try and keep it as minimal as possible because less distractions and that's it so i've not covered every single menu item here but i've covered at least the main ones if there are some things which i've missed and you want more answers to please write um, a comment down below with what you would like to find out or what i've missed but I would say for 90% of the camera setup, that's really about it. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching the video. Also, thank you so much for the great support for the previous video when I first got this. Uh, yeah, hope you're doing well. Hope you're safe. I know I say it all the time now in these videos, which is a bit strange reflection of the times we're living in. But anyway, I'm waffling. Uh, yeah, stay well and I'll see you in the next video.